This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, let me express my, my gratitude uh, to the American Numismatic Society, uh, to uh, Jesse and Peter and Austin and Ben who are helping out here today, and also, of course, uh, uh, to the Stack family um, for their support of the American Numismatic Society and, and this lecture series in particular. The, the Stack family has been tremendously influential uh, in my, my life and my uh, growth um, as a numismatist, and I'm, I'm grateful for all of the opportunities they've provided and all of the support uh, that they continue to offer um, academic numismatics. Um, let me also mention, I'll, I'll echo what, what Jesse mentioned earlier, this is a, a somewhat solemn topic. Um, when we talk about uh, the history of enslaved Americans, um, it's a, a subject that necessarily uh, kind of hits us in the feels. It's, it's an emotional topic. It's a topic that has to be treated uh, respectfully. Um, and I know ultimately so many of the folks that are interested in this uh, subject matter were collectors. We like to collect things. We like to, to gather objects and, and put them in order, and we like to buy them and sell them and own them and brag about owning them. Uh, and this stuff hits a little different on that point. Um, so I'm appreciative uh, in particular of institutional collections like the American Numismatic Societies uh, and others that, that are able to hold this material, um, not because I think private ownership of this material is a, a bad or a negative influence, in fact, quite the opposite. I think passionate collectors often do a better job interpreting and spreading the gospel of the importance of this material than anybody else does, but it is vital that we have uh, institutions like the ANS and others uh, who are able to share this material when other museums and other learned organizations uh, uh, come forward and say, uh, help us interpret this very sensitive subject with something tangible uh, to make it more real. Um, so having repositories like this that hold objects like this are very, very important. And I would encourage those who, who fancy themselves collectors of this material uh, to remember to support those kind of institutions because um, owning things like this um, uh, and having them hidden away in a safe deposit box helps preserve them for future gener generations truly, but items like this really have their greatest impact when they can be shared. So it's, it's great that we have institutions like the ANS um, that, are, that are able to do exactly that. So uh, today our, our, our title, Slave Badges and Dog Tags, Personal Artifact of Enslaved and Free African Americans Before 1865. Oop. Okay, good, thank you. Um, you'll hear me uh, sort of interchangeably use the word enslaved Americans, enslaved African Americans, slaves. Um, that's done more um, out of uh, uh, an interest in, in differentiating uh, ourselves rhetorically uh, than minimizing the fact that ultimately these were people and these were Americans. Uh, and this history of slavery and of American slavery is not a black history, it's not an African American history, it's an American history. This is a history that all Americans share, uh, and ultimately a history that all white Americans, whether you're uh, uh, folks got here through Ellis Island 100 years ago, like some of mine did, or were here in the 18th century, like some others of mine did, uh, have benefited from. So um, just a, a word on terminology, we'll, we'll try to use all of those various terms uh, interchangeably. Um, as, as Jesse noted, ultimately this is a conversation about material culture. So what is material culture? And my, my favorite uh, definition actually comes from a professor at Northern Illinois University. Material culture is the physical evidence of human experience. So ultimately, what does that mean? It's stuff. Material culture is, is tangible. It's possessions. It's objects. Uh, it could also be things that maybe aren't handheld, tangible um, items like buildings or, or relics of buildings or, or this sort of thing. Um, slavery for most people living in 2022, not all but most, is an abstraction. It's an idea, it's a concept from the past, um, which makes this material culture play an even larger role in understanding it because it is so difficult for us to wrap our heads around. Um, for African-Americans who were alive and uh, active in the economy, active in their own family lives, active as individuals before 1865, whether free or enslaved, material culture in 2022 from those people is scarce. 
uh, and most of the objects associated with Americans like that uh, have been found uh, by archaeological means. Um, very, very little uh, has survived. Um, and the, the reasons for that should be self-evident. Obviously, uh, those who were enslaved uh, were not really allowed to own things. Uh, some did end up with some uh, meager groups of possessions. Uh, and even free African Americans, typically, not exclusively, but typically, uh, were at lower rungs of the economic ladder uh, and left uh, very little behind compared to the amount that, that, that white Americans of the same uh, era left behind uh, who came from a place of wealth. Um, less than a mile from here um, is the National Monument devoted to the African burial grounds, uh, which was here in New York City. It was active in the 18th century, although uh, there's some evidence that there was uh, graves dating back to the 17th century on the same site here in Lower Manhattan. Uh, and the archaeological work done there uh, uncovered some of these uh, fairly small uh, personal items, uh, material culture artifacts from those graves. Um, uh, things like an ear bob uh, or rings or clothing pins. Uh, these are all important items, even though they're not large, they're not flashy. But what they are unfortunately divorced from is the narrative, the story of the individuals who owned them. Um, we can learn a lot from these kinds of objects, particularly in context and when compared against other uh, archaeologically recovered things from the same or, or different sites. But ultimately, collectors were storytellers. Numismatists are storytellers. That's why we like the objects that we like, whether it's as students or as collectors. And it's hard to tell stories from these, which for any of us who consider ourselves historians is painful. It's difficult that there have been hundreds of thousands of Americans who have lived and died, who have had uh, interesting stories and interesting arcs of their lives, free and enslaved, that we know nothing about and will never know anything about. There aren't paper documents. There aren't um, massive files. Um, the importance of oral history is finally being appreciated in more recent years, but it's very unusual for good oral history to go back to the 17th and early 18th centuries. So you have to deal with these items and, and sort of realize a sense of loss. I mean, as historians, there's always hope that, you know, that next repository I go to, that next archive, we're going to find this stuff out. For a lot of these people, we're never going to know. So we really have to cling to that which can teach us and, and that which can actually offer some insight um, into individual people. Uh, so what we're left with are uh, many times individual items taken from those who were famous or notorious. Uh, Nat Turner uh, led an uprising in Virginia in 1831, and this was the Bible that was in his hands when he was captured. Uh, and today it's at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, we'll be leaning quite a bit on, on their uh, public domain images um, that they have put up on their website today. I'll point them out when they come up. Uh, and if you ever have the chance to visit Washington, D.C. and go through that museum, if you like museums, you'll love that museum. It's, it's quite possibly the best museum in America on any subject matter. And if this is meaningful subject matter to you, it's going to be an emotional experience and one that you should probably set aside um, more than one day for. It's a really, really incredible museum. And they have things like this here. Um, they also have objects like this, which come from people that are neither famous nor notorious, but are no less important because of that lack of notoriety. Uh, Ashley Sack is one of the most uh, famous surviving objects in the realm of African American material culture uh, from the antebellum era. And uh, it's just a, a very simple plain cloth sack that was embroidered. My great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her it would be filled with my love always, no matter. Uh, she never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. Um, we mentioned Harvey Stack earlier in the introductory part. Harvey Stack was born just a couple years after this was embroidered with memories of a grandmother. Um, 
it's hard not to have an emotional charge when dealing with an object like this that while simple tells an absolutely incredible story about a person that we'll never know much of anything about but who obviously had a tremendous life story uh, obviously full of, of uh, successes and failures that we'll never really be able to understand. Now, whenever you're dealing with heavy emotionally charged subject matter like this stuff, it is natural to try to find the positive, which obviously when you're talking about slavery, it's a little hard. Um, it's, it's challenging to find any glimmer of sunlight in fairly dark material. The Charleston free, uh, free badges are one of those glimmers. Um, modern Americans were an eternally hopeful people. And we tend to look at history as this upward and onward progress that this year will be better than the last, that, that history is ever marching forward. Uh, Martin Luther King wrote about um, that, you know, uh, bending arc of justice. Uh, sometimes that arc of justice is an ebb and flow, and right? sometimes it goes forward and takes two steps back. The post-revolutionary era was a major step forward uh, when it came towards attitudes about abolition uh, against slavery in both North and South. Uh, obviously, a, a slave owner uh, wrote the words, all men are created equal, um, clearly not meaning that all men were created equal, just the ones he had in mind. However, in the post-revolutionary era, there were many, uh, Benjamin Franklin sort of notable among the folks that we call founding fathers, uh, who took those words to heart for what they really should have meant. Uh, and in that decade or two after the American Revolution, there, were, there was great progress um, towards the abolition of slavery. A lot of uh, interest, a lot of interaction um, between English liberals and American liberals on these topics. And so in that short era, there were glimmers of hope that, that uh, took many steps backwards in the early 19th century, uh, particularly after the uprisings led by uh, Denmark Vesey in 1822 uh, and by Nat Turner in 1831. And, and at that point, um, relations between African-Americans, both free and enslaved, uh, and a, a dominant white America uh, really, really did take several steps backwards. But here in the late 1780s in Charleston, you have these free badges very rare today, that are uh, an evidence of hope. In 1783, the city of Charleston in South Carolina, which is sort of, it's referred to as the Jerusalem of slavery. It's really ground zero uh, of American slavery. Um, the 1790 census recorded 600 free black residents, or as they called them then, free persons of color, um, in Charleston in 1790. And in 1783, uh, the city of Charleston, which has uh, at that point not been considered a particularly forward-thinking uh, city, um, decided that, that those who were uh, free persons of color um, could be given a emblem designating them as free that would allow them to have uh, sort of all of the privileges of, of citizenship. It was short-lived. In 1789, they actually canceled that uh, and encouraged free persons of color to move out of town. Um, but for that six year period, they issued these what are today called free badges. Uh, and you can see they're very simple objects. They're copper. They are uniface. They're oval. Um, most but not all are hold. Many were worn for display, but they could also be carried in a pocket. Uh, and they depict something that should be familiar to all American numismatists, your famous Peleus or Liberty Cap on a pole. City of Charleston, and then usually hand engraved with a number. Uh, the ANS specimen is number 33. It has been in this collection since 1927. Um, uh, it's one of the most important, in, in my estimation, pieces in the American collection here, uh, and really one of the most important early American objects of a numismatic ilk of any sort. Um, a 1794 dollar is great. It's the first American dollar. People around the world can recognize that. But this object is so charged with meaning uh, as a way to interpret those who were free persons of color in the urban South in the post-revolutionary era. Uh, it is so charged with that brief and dynamic moment after the revolution when there was hope for abolition that then fairly soon dimmed. 
Uh, and just its symbolism is so simple and crisp and so easy to understand back then and today. Uh, I think it's just an incredibly powerful object. So that's the ANS specimen. Um, the very first auction appearance of uh, one of these things uh, was from a Lyman Lowe sale in 1885. Uh, you can see that it's the ANS specimen, um, number 33, described there by Mr. Lowe in the description, Friedman's badge, Liberty Cap on pole, number 33, very fair and rare. So this thing has been kicking around the numismatic world um, for 140 years now. Uh, this piece was found on eBay. Found on eBay in the 1990s, it was sold by a seller in Texas. It brought roughly $50. eBay was the Wild West back then. Um, this is currently on display uh, at Colonial Williamsburg and will probably stay there for the foreseeable future. Um, it's one of the uh, few examples that has not been dug, um, thereby enabling Colonial Williamsburg to um, put it on display. Um, they generally frown on things that are found by metal detectorists. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but this piece has not been in the ground. Um, you'll notice that the engraving there is not a number. It is a letter, number U. One of the most frequent questions that I get about this kind of material is, oh, these things are all numbered. Has anybody ever looked for the books where we could line up the numbers with the people they were issued to? We've been looking for years. Um, they probably don't exist. Um, when Charleston was under siege and was taken by Union forces, uh, lots of the um, paperwork was dispersed. And unfortunately, um, Charleston continued to disperse its historical documents through the late 1960s. Um, there were old buildings in Charleston that were formerly government buildings uh, in the 1960s that when they were emptied out, people went in and found bound volumes, for instance, of the city of Charleston minutes from the 1830s, and they just hit the marketplace. Um, this is one of those things that you hope someday some Union soldier or somebody picked it up and gave it to the local historical society and will find them. But as of now, we have absolutely no documentation about the individuals to whom these or, or the um, later slave hire badges were issued. Um, interesting thing about this piece is what's on the back. And this will really um, kind of give you a charge if you're an early American uh, numismatic aficionado. Um, these things are all uniface, of course, but it, it doesn't take a genius to say, hey, there's something there. Um, let me help you identify what it is that's there. This piece was made from a recycled printing plate for Charleston paper money. Which is fascinating if you're a coin dork because, hey, currency, we like paper money. But it's more fascinating because it enables us to date this precise object with greater precision than just 1783 to 1789. The small change issue um, that was authorized in 1786 includes some denominations where there are no known survivors from the denominations. The printing plate that was used to make this object was one of the printing plates that produced paper money that we don't know that exists. But we can tell from the fonts, from the style, from the actual text, that it matches up with these other 1786 small change notes printed and issued in Charleston. So after it was printed, um, the last of these was printed in probably July 1786. After it had served its function, they recycled the copper and actually turned it into free badges. Um, Eric Goldstein and I, after I acquired this piece, we sat um, with his wife's makeup compact, a very tiny mirror, at his desk, trying to figure out what the heck this backwards writing was. And then uh, eventually, thanks to Eric, we figured it out. Um, and it was one of the great Eureka moments. Oh my goodness, this is made out of a paper, a printing plate for paper money. Which makes this particular object, obviously, particularly interesting and particularly easy to interpret. So this is the most recent of these to have been uh, discovered. This was uh, dug up um, in the spring of 2021. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about metal detecting and what this has to do with this part of uh, numismatics. Um, there's going to be a supermarket where this was dug up. They're probably paving it as we speak. Uh, state of South Carolina spends a lot of money on a lot of different things. Right now they're spending money on banning TikTok. Um, they do not spend a lot of money supporting archaeology. 
which means had somebody not gone in on a Saturday morning with a metal detector, had some private citizen with muddy boots and jeans not gone in there and dug this thing up with a spade after finding it with his metal detector, this would have been paved over. Or the fill used to dig out the parking lot of the foundation or whatever would have been dumped in the Ashley River. Either way, we all love archaeology here. We all support archaeology. We all uh, support the science of archaeology. A lot of folks look down on metal detecting, which I understand. Nobody wants a, a, a historic site picked clean by treasure hunters. However, in this case, they literally saved this object from oblivion. It would not exist were it not for a metal detectorist getting out there with muddy boots and jeans on. Um, this piece survived in superb condition, was not bent. Um, there is still the dirt in the hole. Um, and uh, you can see that's the moment it was found and came out of the dirt. And the guy laid it on the ground and took a picture of it. And that's the picture he took. That was found um, on, in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, um, right across the river, uh, just uh, sort of north and east of, of the peninsula of the city of Charleston. And that's its glamour shot there on the right hand side, slightly, but not too cleaned up. And it's currently on display at the a and &E Museum in Colorado Springs. So other examples, uh, there was one of these in the Garrett sale in Garrett four, which was probably the first one that modern numismatists ever encountered. Uh, this one is not hold, not mounted, anything like that, not repaired. Um, Garrett bought it from an 1885, I'm sorry, 1884 Woodward sale, which was actually the collection of Woodward's own collection, or the catalog of Woodward's own collection. Um, Woodward probably acquired this sometime in the 1860s. You start seeing these things show up uh, really in the late 1860s and 1870s as Union soldiers came home, as souvenir hunters went to the South and started bringing objects back. Um, but uh, this one ended up in the Garrett collection. Um, it stayed there until 1981. I do not know the current whereabouts of this one. This one, of course, is also undug. Uh, among others, uh, the one there on the left was in a stack sale in 2008. Um, and the other one here, you can see the condition it was in when it was recovered and what it looks like now. So it goes. Um, and this piece is probably also bound for a, a museum collection here in the next year or two. Uh, the three others, and this is all of them, there's nine of these. So you're seeing pictures of literally every one that exists. The, the Charleston Museum has one, again, not dug, uh, that was donated to them in 1923. Uh, I'm supposed to ask permission to use their um, uh, images. Instead, I will apologize for not asking permission. Thank you. Um, then there's another uh, dug one there in the middle. And oddly enough, the, the one there on the right is made of silver. It's the only silver one. Uh, it's hold. Um, the, apparently, I've not seen this piece in person, but apparently there's a very small, fine uh, inscription of JG on the reverse, on the plain back of this. Uh, and one researcher has gone through that census of free persons of color from 1790 and come up with one free person of color who had a uh, job that would have enabled him to be wealthy enough to afford one of these in silver. Uh, so this quite possibly was the property of a cabinet maker named John Guff. Um, I think that's likely, but it's, it's obviously difficult to prove. Uh, this thing was known shortly after the Civil War. It was published. It disappeared from time. Uh, and the more modern provenance story says that it was found between cobblestones. Um, whether or not that's an accurate origin story for it or not is up for some debate. So the flip side of the free badges, the Charleston slave hire badges, these are colloquially known as slave tags. Uh, in their day, when these were actually useful objects and not collectibles, they were called slave badges or hire badges. Um, and this is a conversation we ought to have about them. Are they terrible relics or are they talismans of somewhat limited or very limited freedom? And, and of course, they can be both of those things. Um, slave tags, slave badges were issued in Charleston and only in Charleston. Uh, from 1800 to 1864. Uh, many other uh, southern cities had laws on the books about the hiring of slaves, which is to say that masters could hire out the, the talents of their enslaved African Americans um, and charge money for them. Um, this was done all over the cities of the South. Uh, Charleston and others had a very well-defined legal and leg legislative structure surrounding this uh, because they saw it as dangerous not only because they were giving enslaved African Americans some measure of freedom to move about on their own without supervision, but also because they were giving them resources like secrecy, privacy, and money. And that's where these become talismans of limited freedom. Um, 
servants were generally domestics. Somebody left town for the summer and tried to go someplace with a little bit less uh, yellow fever or something. They might leave their um, their domestic staff in Charleston and let somebody else basically rent them, uh, hire them out, uh, and pay them wages. The same goes for these other occupations. And in the process of doing that, many of those enslaved African Americans would use their talents to actually earn their own money. And anybody who has had a teenager can attest to uh, someone with a little bit of money has a lot more freedom than someone with no money. Um, we actually know of cases of, of enslaved Charlestonians uh, who through the hire system were actually able to get enough money to purchase their own freedom, purchase their family's freedom. Uh, and obviously for a dominant slaveholding paradigm for that white majority, that was frightening. Um, but for these African Americans who wore these badges, and they were not issued to every slave in Charleston, but only those who were actually involved in the slave hire economy, um, to them it represented agency. It represented an ability to make their own decisions, uh, personal and economic, to be players in the economy, to build networks, to build relationships, to further their skills or acquire completely new skills. Um, and in those stories, damnably few of which we actually know, but in those stories are those glimmers of hope, are those uh, single sunbeams of freedom uh, in an environment that discouraged any. Um, and for every one of these slave hire badges that survives, they are emblematic of those stories, of the moments that these Americans were able to interact with others, their families, those who hired them, um, their colleagues and cohorts, in a way that was not completely under the thumb of a slaveholding um, majority paradigm in Charleston. Um, the way slave hire badges worked, you would pay a tax, a, a master would pay a tax on um, their enslaved help. Um, every year you would have to get a new badge. The badges went back and forth by shape. Um, so later on when they were sort of diamond shape in even years they would be square or in uh, odd years they would be, uh, yeah, even year, years they would be diamond, odd years they'd be square. So at distance someone could recognize whether someone was wearing a current up-to-date legal badge. Uh, at first, um, uh, these could just be carried on the person. For servants in particular, they did not have to wear them, though almost all we see are hold. Um, but for others who particularly worked outside, um, they did have to be on public display and worn um, outside the clothing at all times. Um, the 1800 badges are distinctive. Uh, they're small. Um, the names for the occupations are a little bit different than what would emerge later on. And you can see that, that workmanship um, maybe reached its zenith in the mid-19, uh, mid-antebellum period, 1820s, 1830s, we'll get into that a little bit. And then uh, closer to the, the end of the era and during the Civil War, these things became quite a bit smaller, quite a bit cruder, uh, et cetera. Uh, that one there on the right is from 1864, the final year. Uh, and in 1864, the numbers, and these things were numbered successively, um, the numbers are very low for 1864 badges, very, very few um, uh, were actually produced. What we do know from the surviving documentation are the fees that were charged, in other words, the tax that was assessed by each occupation, and how many were issued each year. And we also know how much the city of Charleston paid the um, manufacturers of these badges. That's basically all we know. So servants is the most common occupation that is to be encountered um, today. The second most common is porter, which is basically a dock worker, stevedore. Um, Charleston is a river city. It's a port city. Um, there is obviously lots of import and export going on there. Uh, and so these badges are the, the second most common by occupation um, after the servants. And you can see kind of how they developed through time um, from that first one, which is dated 1802, which is very large, round in shape, uh, 1817 diamond, and then this 1861 later on. And notice that those uh, two on the center and right both have an earthen patina that came out of the ground. That's where most of these come from. Charleston, for those of you who have been there or not been there, has undergone a wave of growth in the last several decades. Um, big hotels go in, uh, big hotels that require digging of very deep holes in the very historic parts of the city. Uh, and inevitably, when they dig downtown, they'll find one or many of these. 
Um, fortunately for, for us in the modern times who are, you know, interested in, in these objects and their preservation, at the end of the year, these were trash. They were literally thrown into privies. They were thrown into creeks. They were thrown in the street. They, there was nothing to be done with them. We'll see an exception to that later on. Um, so actually, lots of these survive. Uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture just acquired a collection of upwards of 160 of these items. Uh, that was uh, built by a Charleston dentist named Harry Hutchins, who wrote a very, very good study, a very good book on, on the subject. Um, there used to be estimates that a few hundred of these things survived. If I had to guess, and I've never really uh, sort of systematically counted them, I started it and then kind of my mind exploded because there's too many of them. I bet there's 1,500 or 2,000 of these things extant. Lots of which are still in the hands of people that wear muddy boots and jeans and swing metal detectors. The third most common occupation after servant and porter is mechanic. A mechanic is anyone who manufactures things. It could be a, a wheelwright or a cooper or a silversmith, a cabinet maker, or someone who works at a diverse uh, array of the skilled trades. Um, mechanics, to my mind, are particularly interesting because the mechanics are the ones most able to earn wages and buy their own freedom, or buy freedom for their families, or get the heck out of Dodge. Uh, and, and move someplace else. Uh, and mechanics obviously covers a, a variety of allied occupations that are interesting to numismatists, silversmiths, uh, engravers. Um, the African Americans who lived under slavery in Charleston had just as many talents and were just as good as these things as the white slaveholders and their allies who taught them these skills. Um, I came upon this interest in African American history. Somebody was asking me this earlier. You know, how does a, a white kid from Pennsylvania end up interested in African American history? Um, I went to the University of Virginia and started working at Monticello, initially interpreting the lives of those enslaved by Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. And as you walk around Monticello, there's lots of material culture objects that were made by Jefferson's very, very talented, very highly trained um, uh, uh, slaves. Uh, pieces of furniture of exquisite dexterity. Um, uh, stories of his chef that was taught in the finest French style while living in Paris. It's a sin that we don't know these individuals' names because their contributions to American arts and science, particularly to uh, what we deem the decorative arts, um, it's hard to appreciate it without the names and their stories attached. But these mechanics badges are items they owned are very personal artifacts of these people that we'll never know about. Um, and that personal connection, I think, is, again, meaningful and emotional for a lot of us. This particular mechanic um, was among those that was just uh, acquired by the um, Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's the only slave badge that I've ever heard of that's actually named which makes it very, very special. Engraved on the back, it says uh, Robert R-O-B-T Cheevers, although it's rendered with just a one E on the uh, plain back of this badge, with an address, 251 East Bay Street. Um, based upon uh, the date of this mechanic, this is dated 1815, uh, there was a city census conducted that year. Harry Hutchins, who used to own this piece, um, actually found that in that era, uh, at 251 East Bay Street, there was a uh, recent Scottish immigrant working as a silversmith and watchmaker, a man named Patrick McGann. And it's not known if uh, Patrick McGann was not on record as owning um, uh, any slaves. Uh, however, somebody like a Patrick McGann could hire uh, an enslaved African American with certain skills to work for him uh, in his shop or, or what have you. We don't know who Robert Cheevers was, but obviously if he was associated with a watchmaker and silversmith and was wearing a mechanics badge in 1815, we know that he was a talented craftsman, he was an artisan, and that he was earning money from those skills. So uh, of all of these things, which are personal objects from people whose stories we'll never know, this one is, is, is sort of the most tempting and haunting because this guy had a heck of a story and I would love to uncover it someday. Um, the next most common occupation in order is fruiterer, which is one of those words that someone who typically talks fast like me has to slow down to say, but it's not one that rolls off our tongues too easily. 
Um, Fruiterer, uh, when it was first uh, um, uh, conceived in 1800, was actually known as Huckster. That changed by about 1804, and they were called Fruiterer and C, Fruiterer, etc. Um, and then later on, just plain Fruiterer. And this was anybody who sold uh, basically any kind of food stuff in the cities, in the uh, streets of the city of Charleston. Um, so you can see that 1813 one, there were very few fruiterers um, that were um, enabled to, to wear higher badges. That's number two. And most other fruiterers also have low numbers. You see 80 on that one at the center from 1844 and 14 on the 1860 at the far end. Um, but these were street peddlers hawking their wares in the streets of Charleston while wearing this around their neck. And this is what um, hucksters look like. I think the latest known huckster is from 1803, which is a much larger badge. This is the unique huckster uh, from 1800. This is also at the Smithsonian now. And you can see these 1800 badges had punches, did not have the city of Charleston ethnic on them, um, but had an hand engraved number instead of being punched as later ones did. Next most common uh, after Fruiterer is Fisher. Again, Charleston's a river town, uh, big fishing industry there. Um, in fact, that's the reason most people go there now is to eat seafood. Um, and you can see an 1800 fisher uh, on the left, which fortunately was left alone and not straightened and not restored. Uh, an 1823 fisher in the center and an 1842 fisher uh, at the right. Um, fishers are actually more common from the earlier era than the later era for whatever reason. Um, there were uh, much fewer in, in enslaved fisher uh, fishermen um, um, in the later era. And let me make a mention of, of fishermen versus fisherwomen. Um, for most who were hired out who were not domestics, who were not servants, the vast majority of these people would have been men. Um, not exclusively. Again, we don't know all the individuals. We don't know all their names or their stories. But the vast, vast majority of these um, folks would have um, um, been men. Um, most hiring was done around Charleston or in the vicinity, uh, but uh, slave hire badges have been found as far away as Mississippi, um, as Charleston slaves were essentially rented out to plantations far afield, or potentially sold to somewhere else and took this with them as a memento of Charleston. And carpenter is the rarest of the occupations, unless you count huckster, which again is just basically the same as fruiterer. Uh, carpenter was only um, uh, accomplished for a few years. I've only seen a handful of these things. Um, 1811 is a distinctive year in the history of, of the Charleston slave hire badges. It's the only year where they use this distinctive scallop design. Uh, for many of us, the first time we saw slave hire badges in a modern numismatic auction catalog was the 1993 sale of the FCC Boyd John Ford collection of these. Uh, and Ford had one of these that was essentially truncated. The bottom half was chopped off below the occupation. And it, it took a minute for enough of these things to be found for people to realize that that piece was actually an alteration, that this is what they look like when complete. So the makers of these things, these were white artisans, um, typically silversmiths or other uh, workers in metal. Uh, Ralph Admar Jr. Uh, produced all the 1800 ones and never produced any higher badges after 1800. Uh, Charles Prince um, made these from 1801 to 1807, uh, marked them on the back. Um, his tend to be very, very large, either round or octagonal, some are square. Uh, and the most famous maker of these is John Joseph Lafar, who came from a, a long family of, uh, or a big family of uh, blacksmiths and other workers in metal. He made these things from 1810 through 1834. Lafar was the last to actually mark these with his name. Uh, other folks manufactured these from 1835 uh, through the end. We know who they are, but they did not actually mark their wares with their names. Okay, so we said that these things were trash after their year of use. Unless you're under siege by the Union Army, in which case recycling becomes real important. So when you encounter an 1863 Charleston Slave Hire Badge, if you look carefully enough, you will probably see an 1862 Charleston Slave Hire Badge underneath it. Uh, on some, it's real obvious. On the one on the right, you can see there's an 1862 Porter. Um, on the back of an 1863 Servant Tag. On others, um, it's less easy to see. But that one on the left um, from 1863 may have actually been recycled twice because the Porter occupation on the front of the badge is actually stamped over an earlier occupation too. Um, you'll also notice that um, the order of the various uh, pieces of information on there were put in a different order uh, from year to year. Um, 
they're entirely consistent within a year and purposefully different from year to year uh, as a counterfeit detection device in that era. Uh, and today that's useful um, because most of the counterfeiters, and obviously for every one real Charleston slave hire badger you have to see, you're going to see probably 50 or 100 fake ones. Um, uh, that is a useful way to determine whether or not something's authentic. Fortunately, most of the fake slave hire badges um, uh, really announce themselves and don't take a whole lot of thought to, to uh, actually figure out if they're fake or not. Uh, and then, of course, there are complete fantasies, hand engraved, Aunt Jemima, Kickapoo Plantation. This was, some of these are really ridiculous. And unfortunately, some of those really ridiculous ones, in fact, there is an Aunt Jemima slave hire badge currently on display at a museum in Richmond as a real object which is sad. Um, but unfortunately, the the state of the art on academics of these things, there hasn't been a whole lot published aside from the Hutchins book. Hutchins book only came out about 15 years ago. And before that, curators were up to their own. And, you know, you, you get a collection donated, you're going to, you know, try to put things on display that are interesting. So there are lots of these fake ones afoot. So if you see one of these things at a yard sale, at a flea market, on wish.com, on eBay, just be aware, the odds are fairly good that it's fake. Okay, so uh, slave hire badges uh, in the numismatic world. Uh, these things have been in numismatic auction catalogs for years. Um, uh, you see two sales there from 1895 that describe these things as identification checks for slaves, um, in the words of, uh, let's see, that's Ed Frossard. Uh, and then um, Scott Stamp and Coin calls it a Charleston slave pass. Um, it's always great when they actually put the serial number in there because then we can actually get a real provenance uh, for some of the ones that exist today. Um, most of the time they did not. Uh, Lyman Lowe, perhaps the most unsung American numismatist of his generation, uh, he actually fully cataloged one there uh, at the bottom, 1853 Fruiterer number 30. So that one should still be around someplace and we can, we can pedigree it back to that Lyman Lowe sale. Um, Tom Elder cataloged these fairly, re uh, fairly frequently in the 1930s. Uh, and he had some interesting comments about how they were still being sold um, by the antique dealers of Charleston who put trays of these things out for tourists in the 1930s uh, and also described how they would mix in one real one with several fake ones. So the idea of faking these things for collectors is not new and many of the fakes that we see are actually quite old at this point. There we go. Okay, so the collection uh, here at the American Numismatic Society, uh, there are five of these pieces uh, that were uh, uh, mostly brought in the collection uh, between 1903 and 1928. One there is a found in collection item. Uh, and you can see there's a good variety here. There are um, uh, three servants, two porters, the two most common occupations, uh, ranging in date uh, from 1815 to 1863. Uh, the most important of these is in the upper right though, and you can see that one is named to Charleston Neck which is a particular geographic subset of Charleston, which is further north on the peninsula. The city of Charleston is on a fairly thin peninsula between two rivers, kind of like the peninsula we're standing on right now. Um, and Charleston Neck was further uptown, if you want to use the New York way of looking at things. Uh, there are only a handful of Charleston Neck tags around. This is one of the best condition ones. Uh, those in 1849 and 1850 look pretty much just like Charleston tags. They were made by the same fellow, William Rouse. Those from 1847 and 1848, if you didn't know better, you'd think they were fake because they have a very handmade look. Everything is, is done in, in single letter punches, but they've been found with some archaeological care by metal detectors who do this uh, frequently, and they are, in fact, genuine. Okay, so at the end of the slave hire badge period, we start moving into a, a, a much different era for African Americans, both in the Carolinas and elsewhere. Uh, in 1862, um, Washington, D.C. started facing um, fairly significant calls to arm free African Americans and allow them uh, to fight in the Union Army. Uh, in the South, the very first African Americans who were organized into a military unit were organized by David Hunter in South Carolina in the Sea Islands right off of uh, Charleston. Hilton Head was where he was based, so if you're familiar with the area, uh, a little bit further down the coast. Uh, Hunter was basically told, you can't do that until Congress acts. Congress acted fairly swiftly, and in the middle of 1862, they passed what's called the Confiscation Act. And the Confiscation Act said that, that if what they called contraband, in other words, enslaved African Americans, made their way to Union lines, they were free. 
And if they were free, they could be put to work for the Union Army uh, in whatever role the local um, uh, commanding officer saw fit, which means they could cook or dig him, uh, him, uh, uh, dig earthworks, or you could give him a gun, organize him, give him a uniform, train him up, and tell him to go kill some Confederates, which is eventually what happened. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, of course, was announced in 1862 and officially took um, uh, took effect on January 1st, 1863. And soon thereafter, the federal government actually authorized the organization of the U.S. Colored Troops, the United States Colored Infantry, uh, Artillery, and Cavalry. The broadside there on the right was actually uh, authored by Frederick Douglass, who uh, put out the call, uh, Two Arms, Now or Never. It's a very, very famous um, uh, broadside. On the left is a pocket-sized, literally two-inch tall, a version of the Emancipation Proclamation that was printed up north and handed out to Union soldiers uh, when they encountered contrabands so that they could actually read the document that made them free Americans. So the process of inducting the recently enslaved uh, into the U.S. military, of course, created um, numismatic items. But before we get to that, the District of Columbia, then and now, is completely controlled by Congress. In 1862, um, advantaged by the fact that those who supported slavery were no longer in the body, uh, those who remained, who tended to have a bit of an abolitionist bent, decided to free those that they could, uh, more or less by congressional fiat, and in April of 1862, decided to free all enslaved African Americans within the District of Columbia which was a sizable number. Um, soon thereafter, some sutler working in Washington, D.C., a sutler was essentially a peddler, a merchant who was attached to a military unit. Some sutler who was in Washington, D.C. began producing these badges. Based upon what the obverse die was muled with, in other words, what other reverses um, appear um, in combination with that obverse, it was probably a sutler attached to a Rhode Island regiment that was then in the defense of Washington, D.C. And there was a small number of these badges that are named to individuals who were able to find in later censuses, able to trace genealogically with real honest to God historical documentation that they purchased or were given these souvenirs indicating the moment they became free which is an incredibly special thing. Um, this is the one in the American Numismatic Society collection. This is here, um, named to a woman named Sarah Ann Prout. Um, there we go. Uh, this is the one with the oldest provenance. This was recently sold in the DeWitt collection, uh, unfortunately sold without its wonderful provenance, which to my mind makes it even more important. Uh, this thing was in Isaac Wood's collection. He was the secretary of the American Numismatic and Archaeological Society in the 1860s and early 1870s. Um, and he owned this and it was sold in his collection in 1873. So for it to have been manufactured in 1862, pretty well dinged up, as it's described there, a good deal abused, and already in a numismatist collection before 1873, it speaks to a wonderful appreciation of, of contemporary objects. Um, uh, we don't know who Peking is. It's a common enough name. It, it, it could be lots of different people um, that later appeared in the census. Um, but this was worn. This was displayed. This was appreciated and shown off. And somehow, a white guy in New York ended up with it in his coin cabinet. And uh, it was in DeWitt's cabinet for many, many years um, and now has found a new home. It cost $1.25 in 1873. Uh, there are 12 recorded specimens of these, 12. 12 recorded means I know of 12. I'm sure there are others. Um, four of which are named to women, one of which is named to two women, which is interesting. Um, it is interesting that this was an object that was uh, available at a place where women were welcome. It is interesting that these were women that actually had money to spend to acquire personal adornment. Uh, and none of them say Mrs. So-and-so. They all have their names. These are very, very personal things. And it's, you know, for African Americans in Washington, D.C. at the 1860s to be wearing something um, that is that individual and that personalized for a black woman in Washington, D.C. during the Civil War, these are kind of revolutionary objects and really special for that reason. Um, the Baker specimen uh, there at the upper left 
Uh, it has a pedigree back to a Massimore sale in 1884. It was at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania until it wasn't. Uh, and it's now at the American Numismatic Association. Uh, and then the other one here is actually the one in my collection, uh, named to a guy named Reuben Tyler. Uh, and uh, we're able to find where Reuben Tyler lived. He lived on Tin Cup Alley. Uh, which is about three blocks off of the mall in Washington, D.C., um, just south of the National Mall. So interesting stories these have. Um, there are six of these known. Two of them are perfect mint state. This is one of them. It has since been liberated from this terrible encapsulation it was put in. Um, sometimes you really enjoy taking up a hammer. This is one of those times. Um, this and another one was actually uh, sold on eBay from a family in Rhode Island who also had the stamping machine that was used to make it. And we never knew how these things were made. And basically they were made with the help of a thin tin stencil that kept the lines even and properly spaced, which is why the spacing is so uniform despite the fact that they were individual letter punches and a jig that allowed individual punches to be put in and then rotated into position in such a way that they could be placed with some semblance of regularity. Um, the others are not as high grade as these two that apparently um, survived in some Union soldier's family, presumably that sutler. Um, the first recorded numismatic appearance of one of these in an auction catalog that I've seen was in a Frizzard sale in June 1900. Among these dog tags and these the obverse is here these blanks whatever you want to call them these were manufactured to be worn as dog tags or what we call identification discs by soldiers um among those that were pressed into service for someone other than soldiers for pressed into service for recently emancipated african americans this is perhaps the most interesting um the lincoln type is a pretty common type it was mostly used relatively early in the war you can see there it's uh, called the war of 1861 on the very well-worn obverse which tells us which side was worn and displayed outward facing. Um, there are not many African-American Dennis Addisons in the records. Um, probably the best uh, potential match for this person um, was a man who was freed when he went to Union Lines in central Alabama in late 1862. Um, but presumably this would have been acquired from a sutler um, by the Union troops uh, that he befriended or worked with and presented to him, Dennis Addison, liberated from slavery, January 1st, 1863. Um, the wear on this thing is perhaps the most special thing about it, because Dennis Addison, he didn't just wear this for a year or two years or three years. Anybody who's ever carried a pocket piece knows how long it takes to wear something down this far. Um, or if you look at Indian peace medals that were worn for several generations successively, how they wore for those who were worn by a, a father and son and grandson. Dennis Addison wore this for decades as an emblem of the moment he became free. So this is an extraordinary item. Um, there are only two of these known. Um, this is the other one. Uh, it's a little rougher. Uh, the hole is a little bigger, a little cruder, but it's manufactured from the same blank and with the same punch set and all of that kind of thing. So, and these are the only two I've ever known. Um, this one actually turned up in an antique store in Maryland about 1997, and the guy that owned it um, uh, didn't know much about it until fairly recent years. You know, saw it in an antique store and thought it was pretty neat. He was right. It's real neat. But again, you can see how well worn this is. Um, anybody who's ever tried to put a rim bruise on anything knows how hard it is. This thing saw a life of work and abuse, and the size of the holes is also indicative of that. Okay, so dog tags, military dog tags, or what we, we typically call identification discs. Um, those that were, uh, that were produced by or for African-American troops are very rare and obviously very special. Uh, and the nice thing about those named to members of the U.S. Colored Troops or African-American units, there's records on all these guys. Um, you know, we know uh, when they signed up, how long they served, uh, where they mustered out. Uh, so that makes tracing the narrative and the story of these much, much easier uh, and, and much more gratifying than some of the other objects that we will plain never know who they belong to or what their story was. Uh, this particular one, again, was an eBay find. A friend of mine bought this several years ago on eBay, uh, named to John Williams of the 2nd North Carolina Colored Volunteers, uh, which eventually became the 36th U.S. Colored Troops. Um, and you can see the, the uh, focus there. 2nd uh, Regiment NCC Vol, 
uh, when he bought this, the fellow thought that meant North Carolina Confederate volunteers. Nah, it's much cooler than that. Much cooler. And this was probably made sometime in the middle of 1863. You can see this blank for this particular dog tag was made referencing the fact that the war had continued into 1863. Interestingly, another dog tag on the same style blank from the exact same unit exists. This is in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and it's named to the drummer of the unit, which is even more interesting, a man named George Washington. Now, needless to say, when we talk about the stories of emancipated African Americans or enslaved African Americans, their names were not their own. Um, and for anybody who values history, especially family history and genealogy, that's a painful thing. You know, it, it's, it, it, I heard a chuckle when we saw the name George Washington, and yeah, it's interesting, it's sort of fun. His name was George Washington, that was the name he adopted, but he adopted that because his other name was, was stolen. His family heritage was stolen. Um, in the talk about things like reparations, you can give descendants of enslaved African Americans access to education or, or uh, entryways into the economy. You can't give that family heritage back once stolen. It's gone. And so something like this, while powerful, and while on some hand sort of fun that this man adopted the name of the founding father, um, it's also troubling, and it's a reminder of what was taken from them. So the 36th U.S. Colored Troops uh, became one of the most decorated regiments uh, in the Civil War, black or white. Um, this is an example of what's typically called the Benjamin Butler U.S. Colored Troops Medal, um, or sometimes called um, the um, uh, Medal for Newmarket Heights. Uh, which was the primary um, uh, battle for which it was awarded. Uh, Benjamin Butler essentially saw the heroism of those uh, black troops fighting uh, and decided that if the U.S. government wasn't going to recognize their contributions that he wouldn't, he actually had this medal struck himself. Um, he designed it to be like one of the Crimea medals. Um, same size, same shape, all this sort of thing. Uh, and this one was awarded to a member of the 36 U.S. Colored Troops, and we know that because his name is engraved on the edge. And while there's a fairly significant number of these that have survived, most were, were probably uh, given to Benjamin Butler's friends, uh, white officers, typically these um, uh, color troop units had white officer corps. Um, I only know of three that actually were named to their recipients. This is, this is one of them awarded to Sergeant Ar Abraham Armstead, um, who came to the North Carolina Union lines as contraband. Uh, he was 43 years old, which immediately made him a sergeant because he was a man of some experience. Uh, and he actually ended up becoming the color sergeant. He carried the flag of the 36 U.S. colored troops at the Battle of Newmarket Heights. Special item. And you can see again from the wear and abuse, he didn't just wear this for a year or two and put it in a drawer. This was worn and displayed for a long time. Um, this is a, a particularly neat one. This is a, a, a dog tag or an identification disc made before the U.S. colored troops actually um, were organized federally. Individual states uh, were permitted to um, have units of African-American soldiers. The 54th Massachusetts, of course, is the most famous of those. This one, the 1st Michigan Colored Infantry, is, is interesting because among those who joined up, of course, were native Michiganders, um, both formerly enslaved and born free, but also uh, those who fled via the Underground Railroad to Ontario and fled into Canada. And when they heard they had the opportunity to go south to fight for the freedom of quite literally their family members, cross back into Michigan, join up, and headed south, which is the most dramatic kind of heroism you can imagine. You're safe in Canada, you're free forever, and you go and sign up in your former country, the country that enslaved you, in your former country's military to go south to try to bring others along. Um, uh, Private Henderson here uh, didn't actually get into the fight. He uh, died of disease at Hilton Head uh, before this unit ever actually saw battle. Um, but the 102 U.S. Colored Troops did eventually see battle, um, but unfortunately after Mr. Henderson had passed. It's notable the way this is laid out on the back. W.S. Henderson, uh, Company E, 1st MCG, probably Michigan Colored Guard. And there's kind of that extraneous letter. When these things were hooked up to the jig for the actual punching, you see a lot of misplaced letters, incorrect letters, letters over letters. Um, and you have to imagine that those made for 
uh, African-American troops were probably made more carelessly than others, uh, and we see that on a regular basis, that these are always made a little bit more crudely. And on the bottom there, probably U.S. Colored Volunteers is what U.S. CV stands for. Uh, Sergeant Alexander Burns, this is a nice uh, high grade dog tag um, from Ohio with the 5th U.S. Color Troops, uh, started life as the 127th Ohio Infantry. Um, and all of the ones that we see from the 5th U.S. Color Troops are all on this same style of blank uh, identification disc. This is small cent size, this is Indian penny sized, except it has McClellan on it. And you can see instead of saying Fayette County, Ohio, it says Fayette County OO as an abbreviation for Ohio. Here's another one from the same unit. They actually misspelled this guy's name, C.P. Moore with one O. It should have been C.P. Moore with two O's. Charles P. Moore was a private. This piece, you know, bears the corrosion from, from being dug. A lot of these get dug at, at battle sites. Um, uh, this one's in the collection of the National uh, Museum of uh, African American History and Culture. Milton Holland is one of the more famous members of this regiment of the 5th U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, he wore, won the Congressional Medal of Honor um, for the Battle of Newmarket Heights. And uh, if you see the dangly medal there, um, just adjacent to his uh, button line, that's his Butler Medal. We saw the Butler Medal from the 36th U.S. Colored Troops earlier. That was Milton Holland's. Uh, this is an identification disc with original hanger, which is very unusual, um, from Benjamin George Hannon of the 97th U.S. Colored Troops. Um, this was a Louisiana regiment uh, that was built from the uh, remaining troops from one of the Corps d'Afrique. Uh, the first Corps d'Afrique was actually built uh, from free black and Creole men that had actually offered to protect New Orleans under the Confederacy. The Confederacy declined their services. Um, when Union troops showed up, actually it was Benjamin Butler, same guy that made the, the Butler U.S. Colored Troops medal. When Butler showed up, these guys tried again to sign up. Butler said, absolutely welcome aboard. And they became a very, very highly decorated units. Um, the third regiment of the Corps d'Afrique became the 97th U.S. Colored Troops. Um, this piece is now at the Atlanta uh, History Center. Um, and you can see there uh, a fellow from a different U.S. Colored Troops unit. That's uh, Sergeant Jacob Johns of the 19th U.S. Colored Troops wearing this exact same style of dog tag with a very distinctively shaped hanger that denotes it as the same. So sometimes you encounter an object with fantastic provenance that you have absolutely no doubt is authentic. And you think if somebody walked up to my table at a coin show and tried to sell me this as a US color troop disc, I would tell them there's no way that's real. Look at it, look how crude it is. It doesn't have any of the usual markings. It's way too distinctive. You made that in your basement last week. No, the descendants of Sergeant Qualls Tibbs actually gave that to the Smithsonian with his picture. So it's absolutely authentic. You see, it's very, very simple. Um, it's got a, a distinctive double hold kind of uh, structure to actually display it rather than the single hole. And it just has his name, Qualls Tibbs, and 27th US Colored Troop uh, on the blank back. Uh, we know there was a manufacturer of, of dog tags who actually wrote to the um, Department of the Army trying to sell these blanks. Uh, so it's sort of not surprising that after uh, his business was declined, some of them did end up in service and ended up in service with uh, the colored troop sutlers. Um, but this is absolutely authentic, and it's really neat to have an image of the exact man who wore this. So these are, are very slightly post-war, but, but still close enough to be relevant. These are the uh, unit badges made by the 54th Massachusetts. 54th Massachusetts, of course, was made most famous by Glory. Um, you know, historic inspired movies from Hollywood always have their problems. Um, you never want to go see a historically based movie with someone who does history for a living because they end up marching out halfway through or throwing popcorn at the screen. Glory is a great movie. And the nice thing about Glory, despite the fact that it's not perfect, is it really introduced the sort of general American populace to the idea of the heroism of the US colored troops and of African-American uh, units in the Civil War. Um, that, um, uh, that movie's sort of big scene is at the um, uh, walls of Fort Wagner, which is today Folly Beach, South Carolina, right outside of Charleston. And you can see these badges actually depict 
Fort Wagner in very stylized um, form, because Fort Wagner is actually made of sand, um, uh, along with their, their battle honors. Uh, Lusty is in Florida. Um, it's literally just a field now. You see Wagner down there at the bottom. Also James Island, which is near Charleston and Darien, which is in the low country of Georgia at the right. Um, these are both in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, They're rarely seen in the marketplace, but they all have the name and the unit. Um, the fact that it lists a lusty there, which is an 1865 battle, basically at the very, very tail end of the war, uh, and the fact that these are so well made tells me that this is of more of a, a veteran's identification, probably made very shortly after they got back to Boston, uh, but would have been worn for parades or that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, they're not as late as some of the veterans things, obviously GAR badges extended well into the 20th century. Um, so they're, they're close enough to be included here, uh, mostly as a way to get in the story of the 54th Massachusetts, which is one of the all time great stories of American history. So as we wrap up here, talking about these, these objects, these artifacts, it's easy to view them like we view coins, something to put in an envelope, put in a drawer, put in a cabinet, collect, oh my gosh, I wanna buy one of those. But we also need to remember that these objects are often the only things we have indicative of real men and real stories. It's all they've got. This is their voice in the modern historical world. And it's up to us to sort of interpret that voice. Any one of those guys looks just like somebody you could have walked past today. They were living, breathing Americans with families and hopes and dreams like anybody else. Um, and it's a shame that we'll never know the names or the stories of any of the guys in that picture. Um, we don't know their names or their backgrounds or their futures. But as you can see, these were men of great dignity and heroism. The legend on the U.S. Colored Troops Medal says in Latin that freedom will be theirs by the sword. They literally fought for their freedom in a way incomparable to the way that any other military unit ever fought for freedom before. Um, they were basically signed up. Some of these units literally were hired out to the Union Army by those who owned them. This is primarily in border states and told that if they served, they would be free. Um, and that one speaks for itself. That's all I've got. So if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. John, thank you very, very much for this fine and, and uh, engaging talk on a rather difficult and haunting subject. Yeah. Um, are, are there any questions from our live audience? Um, yeah. I noticed most of them are all centered out of uh, Charleston. Yes. Is that primarily where they're all from out of Charleston? It's or? literally the only place we know of that actually used yeah. to do this. Okay. While there were other cities that actually had uh, slave hire um, regulations, and some of those regulations actually mentioned things like tickets or passes, Charleston's the only one that appears to have actually issued them and put them into place. Okay. Thank you. you will see fakes that come from other cities, but again, fakes. The nine free tokens that you showed at the very beginning, yes. are they all from the same die? They are. Uh, yeah, they are. And actually, there's a, there's a die crack that, that develops, so we can actually trace them by die state. Yes, sir. Let's wait for you to get the microphone. Hang on one sec. Thank you for, thank you for this great presentation. And my question is out of my absolute ignorance. I was wondering when the African Americans who joined the Union Army to be freed, were their payment just the promise for freedom, or were they actually also being paid? Interesting for question. Serving in the army, they were being paid, uh, and those documents exist. Um, we have the documents from their mustering out. Lots of them survived. Government copies of that, and some of these folks served, fought, got sick, got injured, and then got a bill for their uniform which was more than the money that they earned, not in every case, but in some cases, which is a, a, a real kick in the teeth if there ever was one. But yes, they earned less than white soldiers across the board. But yes, they were paid. And their bounties were lower as well. Outstanding presentation. Thank you.
I'm always interested also in the story of the storytellers. So you gave us a little bit about how you became involved in this level of research. I wonder if you could add more, because it seems to me that something must have happened when you, in fact, was involved at Monticello to actually move you in a direction in which you have gone. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, so I worked with uh, a professor at the University of Virginia, now past, a fellow named uh, Professor Reggie Butler um, at UVA because we don't want to hurt Thomas Jefferson's ego and he never got a doctor. We always call our professors Professor Butler instead of Dr. Butler, which is one of those weird Jeffersonian things. Uh, professor Butler was an incredibly engaging storyteller, um, you know, a real, a real poet when talking about these difficult subjects. Um, are there any hip hop fans in this room? I'm looking around and guessing not. This guy back here. All right, so Diggable Planets, the great, the great hip hop act, Diggable Planets. Um, uh, the the lead front man for Diggable Planets is actually Reggie Butler's son. So he incorporates stories of history from the day that were inspired by his dad. But Reggie Butler inspired me a great deal to tell these stories, and it is emblematic of the advantages of white privilege that I can stand here as an expert on this field and not be doubted or questioned. Uh, whereas it is increasingly difficult, uh, maybe maybe less difficult now than it used to be, for, say, an African-American scholar to come up here and talk about Greek coins. They, they face a much more difficult road than I do trying to become an expert uh, in African-American history. Um, although I, I kind of hate the word expert. Um, Tony's heard me tell this quote before. Will Rogers said an expert was anybody more than 50 miles from home with a briefcase, uh, and I sort of think that's, that's true in academic numismatics as well. Um, inspired by that um, experience at Monticello. Uh, and the fact that when I was there was when you really started to see a turning of perspective. Monticello is a very traditional place. And I was working there in the, in the early to mid 1990s when we were starting to put real science behind um, both the archaeological inquiry and the genealogical inquiries into those enslaved at Monticello. Um, and this is when the science article came out that famously uh, linked Sally Hemings' children to Thomas Jefferson, you know, making Thomas Jefferson not only a slave owner, but a man who enslaved his own children, which puts a slightly different, again, perspective on things. Um, being there at that dynamic time and being charged with the ability to be the first person to communicate those new truths to pretty large groups of people, we would get hundreds of people come through on tour. Um, was a great opportunity and a great responsibility. Um, and one I took seriously and still do. Um, and it, it, it gave me a language and a perspective to wonder if we've ignored these incredibly well-documented historical individuals, those who were enslaved by Thomas Jefferson that we know everything about, birthdays and names and heights and weights and everything you can imagine, all sorts of paperwork. If we're just now beginning to interpret their lives in a real full, humane and human way, what else have we left behind? Uh, and so I started inquiring into other areas of history and obviously uh, pretty much exclusively through the lens of numismatics. It's the language I know. Uh, it's the place where I feel at home. Um, this is ending up in a manuscript that, that, you know, God willing, will be done by the end of the year. It'll be entitled Freedom Will Be Ours, inspired by the Butler Medal, uh, Money and Medals of Black America. And that book will tell the story of any kind of numismatic object, although there's too many to include in one book, that tells a story about African-American history. And again, these are all incomplete stories, but we can use numismatics to sort of access those stories. And it begins with an African cowry shell that was found in an archaeological site at Monticello, a real evidence of an Africanism, as they call it in the, you know, in the nerdy academic field, but at an, a relic of actual Africa in American soil. And it goes all the way up through wooden nickels issued at Mardi Gras, a, a jukebox token from one of the bars where house music was invented in Chicago, uh, the bus token of the sort that Rosa Parks dropped into the, into the box at the front of a bus in Montgomery in 1955, um, and all sorts of other things in between. Um, and it's my hope in telling those stories that more stories will come out uh, because token collectors collect tokens and they say, oh yeah, this was issued by such and such. He was a barber in Brunswick, Georgia. Without ever realizing that that token and dozens of others like it tell a story of heroism and success against all odds that is so distinctive from tokens issued by a white barber in the same town. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping really to sort of change the perspective on these objects and get this material culture not only into academic African American history uh, um, sorts of research, but also into the collector mindset that rather than hole pluggers, we can collect these stories and become the modern agents of folks who had their agency stolen from them. So that's kind of how I came to all of this. And thank you again, John. This, is, this has been fantastic. There are a number of questions from folks at home. Um, uh, Chuck Heck, if you want to jump in and ask your question, I think we should be able to hear you in the room. Otherwise, I can uh, read out your question. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can, I can ask that. I've been hiding behind my uh, screen here. JK. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, Chuck, we can't, we can't hear you when there might be, if there's a. Oh, a fix. you can't hear. It. Uh, but it's nice to see you, hear. Chuck. Hi. Yeah, we can see, we can see you. We, we're not, we're not hearing you in the room, but the question I have here is, have you seen many counterfeit specimens of any of the above objects? And you know, if you do, how many of those exist? Five, 10, a hundred? Sure. Uh, slave hire badges. I see fakes almost every day. Um, fakes outnumber real ones at least 20 to one and maybe 50 or 100 to one. They're all over the place. Um, uh, they are produced in, in mass quantities in modern times for sale at junk shops and gift stores and tourist stops in, in all over the South. And it pains me to see them in museum gift shops. Really, really pains me. Um, so lots and lots of fake slave hire badges. If that's something you're interested in acquiring for a collection, authentication is absolutely mandatory. And obviously not all authenticators are created equal either. Um, I have not encountered a, a fake free badge, although I know that a well-meaning student of the series went ahead and made casts of several of them, um, some of which were marked and some of which weren't, which I hope to God do not make it into public hands someday because they are frighteningly good. And again, he had the best of intentions, but so, you know, there is at least one set of, of fake free badges out there. Uh, in terms of uh, identification discs or dog tags, um, rarely. Uh, I won't say that, that no fakes exist. Um, there are, uh, there's a, a broad series of fakes that were made by one individual that include lots of Native American related things, Confederate related things, and African American related things. But they're so desperately bad that it's hard to even call them fakes. I mean, they're just, you know, other planetary fantasies. They've got, uh, you know, no approximation of anything real. Um, but there are such a thing as, you know, dog tags that have been faked up or units that have been changed or stuff. So authentication should be preferred for those objects as well. And uh, way, just to continue with uh, some of the questions from folks at home, uh, Tony Hine asks, uh, were the manufacturers, he, there are a number, a number of questions here, I'll read them one at sure. a time. Um, uh, were there, uh, were the manufacturers metalsmiths or freelance? Uh, they were metalsmiths. They were just guys that worked in, you know, copper or silver or other kinds of soft metal or durable metal in, in Charleston. So these were guys that did it for a living for whom this was just another contract. Um, could Robert Shavers uh, have been deputized by the silversmith to manufacture his own tag? No. No, those, I mean, this is like a driver's license. This was an official government document. So those, those were all made by one individual with one very narrow set of parameters to, again, ward off counterfeits in that era. And then um, uh, it says, uh, SUNY Buffalo professor Cecil F uh, Foster um, has written a book called They Call Me George about black Pullman car porters supplied by Pullman to the two Canadian transcontinental railroads. Um, Pullman supplied both the sleeping cars and the staff. Um, there's been a TV drama called The Porter. Uh, Canada's Giller Prize was awarded this year to Suzette Smyers, the sleeping car porter about a black man lucky enough to get paid to travel across the country. Um, do you have any relevant uh, notes to well, I'll, to that. so what I'll add to that, you know, as you look for for numismatic items that tell stories of African American history, and you get into some pretty far afield, honestly. Um, sometimes you encounter dollar bills that are signed by Harry Truman. They're not rare; they're out there. They're usually in the autograph field more than the numismatic field. But what the heck? They're dollar bills, so we, we can claim them too. Most of those were actually given to Pullman porters. Um, hmm. That was Harry Truman's way of tipping Pullman porters as he traveled was signing a dollar bill and handing it over. So most of those have an African-American provenance because again, most Pullman porters in Truman's era were African-American, so. Yeah, 
another question here. Yes, of course. Um, you already answered the question that those slave badges are unique to Charleston. Mm -hmm. And my question is, how other uh, slaves in other parts of America were identified? I want to give you an example from sure. the ancient world, Please, the yeah. Greco-Roman world and in the Persian world, they actually tattooed yeah. the name of the owner on the body of the slave. Yeah. And that just made me curious about other parts of America. So I, I showed the image of the vitrine at Colonial Williamsburg that housed the free badge right now. Um, when that space became available, it's because they removed another object off of display, um, which was actually a branding iron. That was one way. Um, uh, if you look through the manuscripts and the documentary evidence on runaways, um, which are everywhere, they're in every newspaper, they're, you know, in every repository, there's lots and lots of this paperwork on these things, you usually get down to physical descriptions, um, you know, their, their build, the clothing they were wearing, this sort of thing. Um, and in the case of, for example, those who were enslaved at Monticello, um, many of which were actually legally white by the Virginia laws of the time and fairly light-skinned. Um, many of those uh, formerly enslaved African-Americans, if they could make it to a place with either a free black community or a fairly accepting white cosmopolitan community, they would just be allowed to pass. Um, and that's actually where several of those formerly enslaved by, by Thomas Jefferson ended up either passing as white or finding a home in a free black community, but having enough ability from their lighter complexion to actually get there safely. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the question. All right. Well, John, thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Thank I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.